Okay, so today um, we're going to talk about SLIM. And this is kind of a, it's a difficult lecture. I rewatched the lecture that I had you guys watch. Uh, I didn't feel like I did it very well. It's not a very well, um, it's, it's hard to understand. So if you get to the point where I'm starting to talk about things in the lecture that are even, even difficult for me in some sense, you know that you should be looking into the literature, reading the papers, because that's going to help you a lot. And so you're going to gain a lot of understanding about SLIM by, by reading the paper. So you might need to start doing that. Um, but the simple like summary of what I was trying to say in that lecture is I started off by saying there are some big limitations to restriction enzyme cloning, right? The limitations to that are the fact that you have to have those specific sites um, and you have to use those sites to clone in your thing. And so if you're, if you're cloning in something and you have an A restriction site and then a B restriction site, you're left, you're stuck with these sites in your construct, okay? And that can sometimes cause problems and these are called scars. So that's one severe limitation of restriction as I'm cloning, okay? The other thing is if you imagine scenarios where we usually don't just we usually don't just want one thing in a plasmid. Usually we're doing like a lot of different things. We might be like modifying or putting in a promoter. We might be like inserting some kind of a tag. We might be making some kind of a mutation. And restriction enzyme cloning like is a start for that, but it's really not going to get you to your end destination. Okay. So I introduced SLIM as this unique technique, and we can use the technique for three different things. What are the three different things? Insertion, deletion. Insertions, deletions, and what? Yeah, mutations and substitutions. Um, and I, in the lecture, I did go into a little bit of a tangent. There was a discussion about how sometimes deletions might mean something kind of different. Okay, there might be different meanings for deletions. We're not using this for chromosomal deletions. So in the example that I gave is in the yeast strains that we've discussed that we use in biotechnology, oftentimes there's deletions of oxytrophic markers that were originally on the yeast chromosome. Okay, you cannot use SLIM to make a deletion of a gene on a yeast chromosome. Why? Why can you not do that? You don't want to PCR the whole chromosome? Yeah, you can't. You cannot PCR the whole chromosome. So that's exactly right. Like, SLIM is a PCR-based method. Um, you, can't, you can't PCR whole chromosomes. Um, so, so, so what you want to understand is the context of deletions that they're talking about is imagine you have gene X in a little plasmid, okay? And you want to delete like a little part of it to maybe study its function. You want to delete this little chunk. Or maybe you want to delete like the N terminus, the five prime N. You can delete this little chunk. So you can use it to chunkify things. You can make little tiny deletions and you can make little tiny insertions. But you're not, you're not going to be using this to make deletions on chromosomes. So that's an important, an important point. And despite the fact that the lecture was a little bit boring this time, I really want to re-emphasize that like, this is a technique that we use every day in the lab. I use this all the time. And so this is something you really want to learn and you're not really going to learn it completely until you try it, which is why in that lecture, I really kind of go into like the protocol and we start talking about how to design the primers and the stuff like that. Um, you do want to, you, you're going to want to get familiar with this when you start working in labs and being asked to do these things. 
Okay. So I also introduced in this lecture, at the very, very end, I also introduced some other cloning terms or PCR-based methods. Um, one is called sewing. I think it's spelled different. I think it's spelled like this. Um, and then also Gibson cloning. So I actually want to start with these. I kind of categorize these together because they all have a similar theme or methodology in why they work. What did you catch what it is? Yes, but I wouldn't phrase it like that. I would I would phrase homology regions more for like recombinating. You're right, but it's more it's it's overhands. These all these methods generate some kind of some kind of product that has like a little overhang. And we saw this before with restriction enzymes. The restriction enzymes induce like a little overhang that becomes sticky, okay? Because the hydrogen bonds are looking for things to bind to. In this case, um, these overhangs in these methods are usually a little bit longer, okay? Maybe they're, maybe they're 15 to 25 base pairs long. And it's, it's sufficient for your understanding to just know that whenever you have an overhang like this, if you can generate a secondary product that has a matching overhang, they can find each other and then now all of a sudden two have become one. So sewing is a way to do this with just iterative PCR reactions. You create primers and the primers have these long overhangs built in. And it's just sort of like iterative reactions. You, you first do a PCR that makes this, you first do a PCR that makes this, and then you mix them together and you do like a third PCR. And just like I said, just know that you're creating situations where you have overhangs, they find each other, and then you can fuse things together. That would be sewing, okay? And even these, there's gonna be so many variants that like, um, when you start doing this, then, then it's time to find a protocol that you wanna try and try that. Now Gibson is the same kind of thing, okay? Gibson is the idea that if you take, if you take two, you make two PCR products, let's say one and two, and imagine you design a scenario where their ends, let's go. Their ends are the same. Imagine you have this scenario. In Gibson cloning, the way that you're creating the overhangs is you're adding this T5 exonuclease. Exonuclease. What do, have we gone over exo versus endonucleases? No. Okay. So what do you think an exonuclease is? That's a good thought, but no. All nucleases in theory should be in the nucleus. So it, does it cleave something off or transport outside the nucleus? No, don't be thinking it. Uh, don't be thinking geographically. Think molecularly. So an endonuclease is going to be a nucleus that can find uh, double-stranded DNA and it can cut it like right in the middle. An exonuclease can only come in from an edge, a blunt end edge, and trim in from an edge. Okay, so imagine you have two products that have this region that overlaps, and you add a T5 exonuclease that can only trim from the edges in. What's going to happen is it's going to it's going to do a little trim here and it's gonna do a little trim here. And now all of a sudden you have sticky ends that match. Does that make sense? So all of these are the same in a sense that what you're doing is you're using these molecular tricks to generate overhangs which then come together and form fused products. That's, that's the gist. This one you do it with an exonuclease, this one you do it with fancy primer designs and PCRs. This one you also do it with fancy primer designs and PCRs. 
Okay, so that's like the overall theme. That's you definitely want to understand at least that level of detail. Okay, so let's talk about slim specifically. This is a, a, a visual image that I think is a little bit um, better than the figure that you actually see in the paper. If I was to draw the primers that you're actually designing in SLIM. And imagine this is the plasmid. This is what the primers look like. So this would be for an insertion. And what you're inserting is this green thing, whatever the green thing is, you get to choose. That's what you're inserting. So SLIM involves a series of four primers, okay? The short primers are just like standard PCR primers. You don't design them anything funky. It's just a short primer that's a forward and a short primer that's a reverse. And then the only difference is you have two extra primers that have this extra thing tacked on, just like we tacked on the restriction sites when we designed primers before. In this case, you're, you're having this forward primer match this primer, and then you're just tacking on literally the sequence you want to insert. And then on this one, which is the reverse complement, you have this sequence and the reverse complement of the insert you're tacking in. And so by mixing all these primers together, Here's the easiest way to understand how SLIM works and what it does, okay. By mixing these primers together and running a PCR all the way around the plasmid, you generate four different products, okay. So let me draw the products that you would generate. And again, imagine this is like wrapped around a plasmid. Product one, will be something that looks like this. A product two will be something that looks like this. The product three is going to be the inverse of this, so it would look like this. And then the last product would be a product that looks like this. Okay, so by mixing these four primers together, you generate these weird PCRs that give you essentially four different products. And once you've generated these, there's a post amplification, denature, cool, denature, cool. So there's essentially a heat step followed by a cool step, and then you do this twice. And the gist of what you're doing after the PCR when you do this is you're popping these things apart. This is double-stranded DNA. So you're popping them apart, okay? And then you're remixing them. You're essentially shuffling. You're shuffling products. And essentially what you are left with at the end is a bunch of products. Some of them are gonna be essentially results of, of these four, but the shuffling allows products to be made that look like essentially what is this. So it looks, if I was to draw it out like I did before, hard to, hard to draw kind of. Imagine you wrap this around itself, you wrap it around in a circle, it would look like this and these things find each other, and it allows this to circularize with that. So you shuffle, 
the products, they mix up, you generate this thing with overhangs. You're gonna generate a bunch of other stuff too, like a bunch of other crap. But some of them are gonna look perfectly like this. And then they wrap around and find themselves and circularize. So now you generate, the final product that you generate is a double-stranded plasmid that looks like that. And it now has your insert. Okay. Now once that happens, there's two key steps that follow this, which are essential to like recovering this. Okay. The first one is the is the heat cool, heat cool, which causes the circularization. And then when you transform this, bacteria are programmed to essentially degrade linear DNA. So if you try to transform some of those other products that that are not circularized into a into a bacteria, they just have exonucleases and endonucleases that will just cut them up. They just destroy them. So bacteria kind of like only likes to receive circularized DNA in plasma form. So one sort of selective mechanism that allows you to recover this insert is the fact that the only thing you can recover is the circularized piece. Okay, so that's one key step. The second key step, um, which I advised you about very early in the class, is the addition of a key enzyme, which is what? DPN. Thank you. DPN1. And why is DPN1 special? It cuts methylated DNA. Okay, now let me explain like mechanistically what's happening with that step. So when you mix up this tube, um, to run your PCR, to run your slim PCR, okay? You put in some reagents. One was primers, two was DNTPs, three was some kind of a buffer, four is some kind of a polymerase, which goes all the way around, uh, five would be water, and six would have been a template which was your original plasmid that you were modifying. The goal of the slim was to take this template and modify it and insert that green sequence. Does that make sense? Okay, this is still there in the tube. This original plasmid that you put in there is still there. So if you do not do DPN1, if you don't do that step, you're gonna transform your E. coli and you're gonna give them a whole bunch of this. There's actually gonna be way more of this than there is of that. So you're essentially just gonna be giving them back the original plasmid, which is unmodified that you were trying to modify. Does that make sense? Like the only way that this works is if you can figure out a way to kill this thing so that only this thing can be recovered. Does that make sense that you want to do that? Okay. So the way that you can kill this product, this template, after the PCR reaction is with DPN1, okay? Because let's go over what happens when you purify plasmid. Where do you get plasmids from? Where did I get this template from that I put into my tube? Where did I get it from? How do I get plasmid? We should know this, I talked about it. Like how would I, how would I get plasmid? Okay, so I get it from E. coli. And the only way for me to get it is to grow it in E. coli, right? Okay, so I would have a stock of E. coli that has this plasmid maybe in my freezer. I pull it out. I get a tube full of LB. LB is media that bacteria grow inside of, okay? And I would inoculate it with some E. coli that had that plasmid. I'd let them grow up under selection. So I probably had like ampicillin in the media. They're going to grow up. And then what am I going to do once they grow up? Kill them and isolate them to purify it. 
plasma. Yeah, there's a name for that. So I'm going to kill them. I'm going to lyse them all and extract plasma. What's the name for that? That's typically called a mini prep. Is, that, is this at least familiar to people? Anytime somebody says mini prep, what they're doing is they're they're purifying plasma from E. coli. Okay. So what you need to know about E. coli is if you generate plasma in E. coli, E. coli methylate their DNA. E. coli methylates DNA. This was way back in like lecture two, I think. Why? Why does E. coli methylate DNA? It protects, it protects itself from restriction enzymes. The restriction enzyme systems are self-defense mechanisms that bacteria have to protect themselves from viruses, okay? This is back in lecture two. And they actually methylate their own DNA so that they can distinguish, okay, what's my DNA and what is like a foreign agent's DNA coming in, okay? They know what's theirs because it's methylated. So. Anytime you purify plasma from E. coli, it will be methylated, okay? Now there's a special restriction enzyme, a special unique one, that preferentially cuts methylated DNA. So if we add that, is it gonna cut this one up? Yes, because this one has the little methyl groups, it's gonna cut this one up because the template came from the E. coli. Where did this one come from? Where did this one come from? PCR. The PCR in the tube. We synthesized it in the tube with the polymerase that we added. Did it come from a bacteria? So is it methylated? No, so it's not methylated. So when you add DPN1, it selectively kills the template so that the only thing that's left is your modified plasma. Then you transform and you recover this. Does that make sense? That is like a technical detail that's extremely important that if you don't understand that, you don't understand how this method is working. And this sort of trick is used in all the time in molecular biology. We use this in site-directed immunogenesis. We use this in all kinds of methods. Okay, so you have to know this little trick. Okay, are there any questions on anything related to that or that lecture? What time is it? 3.30. Okay. So in that paper, they talked about slim detection primers. Okay, uh, what would that be? This is, this is good, let's actually, so let's, if, let's walk through Let's walk through that paper and you guys will start to see how much knowledge you guys have gained. So, okay, you wanna talk about something they call slim detection primers? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes. You're wondering like, what are those? Yes. Okay, my guess is, if you go to the materials and methods, this is a good segue into screening. Screening slim. How do you know if your plasma had the insert. How do you know? So after you transform it, you're gonna plate those E. coli on a plate and you get what are called colonies. You'll pick them. You'll do another mini prep to recover the putative um, modified plasma and then you can screen it, okay? They actually didn't do that. That's the way that I would do it. How did they screen their slim colonies to see if they worked? Colony PCR. Okay, so we've talked about this before. Colony PCR is you want to check the genotype of a particular colony. So you take a little toothpick, you poke the colony, you put it in a PCR tube, and you PCR. So what they probably did to describe these slim detection primers, what they probably did is if this is my insert, this green thing, what they probably did is they probably built a primer forward like this in their insert and one on the backbone going back. So
so that they can amplify this region if it worked. If the reaction worked, the colony is going to produce an amplicon that spans this section. Does that make sense? So it would produce a band in an agarose gel that corresponded to this length, and you'd say, yes, that colony has it. If it didn't have the insert, if there was no insert, this primer would have nowhere to anneal to. So you would never actually get an efficient PCR. It would just always just try to go it would never actually like give you a good PCR. Does that make sense? Ugh. Okay, that's not how I would do it. That's how they did it. How I would screen is like I said before, how I would screen is I would have my plate with my colonies I would pick the colonies, I would mini prep, and I would usually pick about three. Pick three colonies, mini prep, three plasmids, Sanger sequence. And the way that I would design my Sanger sequencing is if this was my plasmid, insert, I would design a Sanger primer that hit right here and would just sing her over my insert. And you just sing your sequence, check your sequence, is the insert there, yes or no? That's the easiest way to do it. But they did colony PCR. One reason they wanted to do colony PCR is because they are actually measuring the efficiency at how well this works. So they probably wanted to screen hundreds of colonies to see the accurate like percentage that are actually getting the insert, which they report is what? I say 95%. Yeah, they say 100% efficiency greater than 95. In my experience, it's not it's not that good. Um, in my experience, it's usually like you pick. This is sort of like true for everything: restriction enzyme cloning, slim, site-direct immunogenesis. You pick three colonies. Usually, one out of three has your insert if you know what you're doing and you're good at what you're doing. Now there are cases where it's hard and it doesn't work. So that's worth like exploring is. Why does it normally come out that way if one and three? Okay, you could ask this question two ways. Um, you could ask, why does one out of three work? Or you could ask, why does two out of three fail? They actually talk about this in the paper. Did you guys catch what they list? One, which I agree with, is one of the reasons why two out of three or colonies you pick are don't have the insert is there's too much template left over. Even if you add the DPN1, even if you do that, and even like I usually let my DPN1 sit overnight, I let it digest all night long, and I transform in the morning. Even if you do that, there's still template old left over from the PCR reaction. Two out of three of yours are probably you're recovering that original template. That's how like much DNA you're adding in when as a template when you do these PCR reactions, and that's also how sort of like few of the correct amplicons you're sort of generating. Um, they give another they give another reason, which they call it PCR mispriming. The thing about these primers is you're mixing not one, not two, not three, but four different primers. Okay, remember they, they look like this. These four different primers you're mixing together, and you're putting extra stuff onto your primers, okay? And the extra stuff could be binding other places of the genome. If you had genomic DNA contaminating your template, they can be um, essentially just not behaving properly. Because anytime you do these methods, these PCR-based methods where you're rigging primers, 
Every time you put more and more and more bases into your primer, it's less and less and less likely to work. Okay, so there's a range at which this works. Typically, like what it works for me in my experience is, like I can add like flag tags easy. I think a flag tag is like something like seven, seven to 10 amino acids. Um, when you start adding tags that are like 15 to 20 amino acids, that starts to get difficult. So there is a limited range of like what you can do. That's why this is, slim is for like little chunks, except it can delete, it can delete big chunks because the deletion mechanism is just slightly a little bit different, but insertions, little stuff. Does that answer your question? Um, actually, actually, 90% uh, of the time it fails because people don't know what they're doing and they like, they design their primers wrong um, or something like that. That's like 90% of why it doesn't work. But if you've gotten it to work before, you have good positive control and you like know you're capable, it's usually like one out of three works. And that's real good, like that, that's good. So if it doesn't work, so, like what can you do to like troubleshoot? If slim like doesn't work, you, you keep trying to do this, this thing. Um, what are some of the things you can do? Any guesses, any ideas? Like wh what would be your first reaction? Slim doesn't work, now what do you do? Just go back to what you mixed up. See if you did it right. Like Definitely, so like, yeah, double check your reaction, make sure you did things right, make sure you followed the protocol. Make sure you added all the reagents. Sure, that's actually often like the first thing. If it didn't work, try it again. Like exa try exactly what you did before. Don't do that a hundred times, but try it again. Double check your steps. See if it works the next time. I do that a lot. Uh, what else could you do? Uh, I would start by checking the primers since there's so many. Yep, so check the primers for sure. Because SLIM involves sort of like detailed primer design. That's the first thing I'll always do is I'll create quick, go back, redesign the primers, check to see if they're the same as what you designed before, double check that your insertion is correct, double check that the reverse complement of your insertion is correct. Definitely check primers. Okay, you do that, then what do you do? Your primers are good, but your slim doesn't work, then what? Any ideas? That's a good one. Yeah, you can, you can more DPN one can, can sometimes work. Um, like I said, typically like in the, in this paper, they say do it for an hour. I usually, instead of adding more DPN one, I usually just give it more time. I usually just always do this overnight, like I said. So I'll usually set up my PCRs in the morning before I leave for, from work, I will set them in the incubator with my DPN one of them sit overnight. That's usually good. Um, okay, so it's not the DPN1, it's not your primers, then what do you do? What do you check? Anytime you're doing PCRs, a thing you always want to vary is the a template volume. Template volume, vary that. So sometimes a SLIM or site-directed immunogenesis or PCR is going to want more templates, sometimes it's going to want less. There's no hard rule, but if you vary it, you can sometimes get something that wasn't working to work. And that means like, so imagine what I was saying, your template is usually like one microliter from a mini prep. That means if you want to vary that, instead, the next time you set up a slim, set up, set up either um, a 10X and a 100X dilution of that mini prep. So then you're taking that one microliter and you're adding nine microliters of water which is a tenfold dilution, and then you're taking one microliter from that as your template. Or you could do a hundredfold dilution, one in 99. Typically, this can work sometimes. Change the template volume. Or maybe you need to add more. Maybe you add two to five microliters of main prep, which is gonna be kind of like outrageous. But, you know, sometimes like doing outrageous things like that, sometimes it makes things work. Like a lot of molecular biology, and when you get good, it's literally on the level of cooking. Like, oh, I'll put a pinch of this, pinch of that. Let me just like, oh, I know from experience, this needs a little bit more of this. It's a lot of it is like that. Um, okay. You try these three things, still can't get it to work. Um, a couple other things I would always say, make sure you're always doing start, uh, hot start. 
always hot start. We shall know what that is. Always do a hot start. Um, four redesign primers. So even if your primers were intellectually designed right, sometimes you get unlucky and a random sequence that you pick, it's not working. So fortunately we have a lot of flexibility with DNA because we can code for the same codons by just, with, with, we, have, we have wobble positions, we can change certain um, DNA sequences but still get the same amino acid sequence. So uh, you might want to flip some codons um, change a few things, redesign the primers, maybe pick a slightly different spot, and oftentimes that can get something that's not working to work. Okay, the final thing, which is literally like the most frustrating thing, but it works, is if you go through all these steps and you need this construct, like you need to get it made, and you can't get it to work, when I've sort of exhausted these options, usually the last thing that is responsible for killing these slims is the backbone. So you might be working in a bigger plasmid. Um, 5,000 is not typically a big plasmid, but imagine you're working in a yeast plasmid that's five to six to seven KB. That's typically on the edge of when slim's not really gonna work. Why, why is this gonna impact whether it works or not? Yeah, it's, it's got to go all the way around, the whole thing. Speaking of which, let me add another one. Um, extension time. Barrier extension time. Because this can take a long time, right? Polymerases have a set max speed. And if you don't give them time to go around, so I'll usually, every time I do a slim, I'll usually start at like 4.5 minutes, regardless of plasmid side for extension. If the plasmid is bigger and needs more, I've done slim reactions of like five to seven minutes extension. Ooh, something's going on with my fingers today. Extend the extension time, give the polymerase more time to go around, sometimes I can fix it. The last thing you can do is if your backbone is just severely limiting your slim reaction, there are some backbones that just, you, they won't let you do it. So what could you do? If you're trying to slim a gene X, you're trying to do something to it in this backbone, what can you do to make it more likely to succeed at slim? Sublimate into a different backbone. Exactly, good. You can switch out the backbone. If this was a restriction enzyme cloning originally, you can just pop it out with A and B and pop it into a new backbone, which is maybe like P blue script, which is 3000 base pairs. Now all of a sudden you've made this way more likely to succeed. This is a huge pain because it's adding in like a whole bunch of extra steps. But if you are desperately need a construct, I guarantee you that this will make things work. Okay. So you can subclone it into a more like what we would call more like manipulating, manipulatable, modifying vector or plasmid. Subclone into a different plasmid. These are all the things you can do to troubleshoot it, get it to work. Okay, how much time do I have? Ten minutes. So I was reading the methods of that paper as well, and it was, it was kind of interesting because their construct size was 6.6 .6 kilo bases. Yeah. And they used half. Yeah. <laughs> Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Not a good idea. It's not a good idea, but this was 2004. Yeah. So um, I, the high fidelity polymerase is probably a lot more expensive in 2004. So I, I don't fault them for using TAC. Most people started off with TAC. Um, but things have come a long way. So yeah, for sure. Like I would never, ever, ever even try a slim or site directed without a high fidelity polymerase. It's pointless. Like you're just going to mutate your insert more likely. Do you know, did they win an award for discovery? Which they, they wouldn't award for, uh, 
they should. <laughs> I use it all the time. No, um, it's the thing, like a lot of method papers, they're, they can become extremely highly cited, but when they first come out, they're usually like, like people don't realize the impact. You know what I mean? And actually like Gary Moles's, uh Nobel Prize winning uh, PCR paper, that was published in like Methods in Enzymology, which is, it's not a bad journal, but it's like a lower journal. And he tried to submit it to Nature, and Nature essentially, essentially like said, no, like we don't want anything to do with this. And then he won the Nobel Prize for it. So that just show, goes to show you how much reviewers know it. Reviewers and editors, they don't know very much. Um, but yeah, if you want to get like a lot of citations and have a huge impact, if you invent like a method, that's like a good way to do it. But the method has to be good. That's the hard part. Uh, okay. Um, it's some of the things I, I think like are worth just like reading and going over because I feel like I, I, perhaps I can be proud with how much you guys have learned. So for instance, it's good that you were reading the materials and methods. Um, we, we should be able to understand these now. So for instance, they say primers were designed to amplify the entire PBAD vector. We should know what that is. Yes? Yes? Okay. Carrying the Escherichia coli bacteriophage T7 DNA polymerase gene. That means their gene X that they had inserted into PBAD was uh, DNA Paul from a virus. Okay, we know what DNA polymerases are. That's the gene that they are like mutating. Um, and it says, with six extra histidine codons on the five prime end. So in front of this gene, they have an N-terminal his tag right in front of it. We should know what that is. That's for purification of the enzyme. So just reading that first paragraph, we have all the information to sort of translate the thing that they're working on, which is their backbone, which is this. I think that's, that's cool. Um, clones were screened by colony PCR. We already talked about that. Yeah, that's kind of it. I won't beat a dead horse. If there aren't any other questions, Say, say that again, I didn't hear that. There's like a measurement unit and it was just a capital U. A capital U. Oh, okay, that's a good question. Um, U is what we call a unit in enzymology or molecular biology. This is not really like, um, it's like a pseudoscientific unit almost. It's like, uh, okay, not unit, unit, I'm unit, using unit recursively here. Um, so essentially like what people will do, the, the like New England Biolabs, which makes a lot of these enzymes, restriction enzymes and stuff, they'll essentially like quantify uh, a certain amount of enzyme, which they call a unit. And then they'll say like one unit cuts X amount of DNA. And then from then on, they just say like, you're buying 1000 units. And usually they try to organize it so like one unit would be like one reaction, if that, if that kind of makes sense. But it's sort of like translating something like, you could imagine they might prefer to put it in micromolar or nanomolar concentration of enzyme. People have a, a hard time translating how many micromoles or nanomoles they would need to get a reaction to work. So the company kind of like tries to do that for them and say, well, we just say we're giving you this many units which is enough to cleave X amount of DNA. So it's like a, it's like a unit of measurement for enzymes. Good question. Okay.